Um, I wish I could say that I guess there would be standing room only for a budget event, but I'm glad there is. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Yuval Levin. I'm uh, Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm the Editor of National Affairs. We're here to, uh, for a discussion organized by National Affairs and by the Art Street Institute, to talk about a subject that uh, may not be splashy, but is awfully important to the health of our system of government, and that is congressional budgeting and its relation to the larger work and the larger health of the U.S. Congress. Uh, the occasion for taking this up, in one sense, is an essay in the current issue of National Affairs. Uh, you can find the current issue back there, if there are any left. Um, by Andrew Taylor, proposing some dramatic reforms of congressional appropriations. But in some ways, the larger occasion for being here is a larger problem that no one can deny, the, the growing dysfunction of the Congress, which seems to be rooted somehow, maybe embodied, uh, in the growing dysfunction of congressional budgeting and the Congress's use of its power of the purse. We're going to talk about that problem today. We'll talk about some potential solutions. We'll think about the prospects for reform and the obstacles to it. And we have for that purpose a great panel of experts who will help us think through uh, the circumstances and the options. We're going to hear first from Andy Taylor, uh, professor of political science in the School of Public and International Affairs at NC State. Um, and as I say, the author of uh, the piece that brought us together today. He's uh, also the author of a number of books about Congress, including The Floor in Congressional Life and Congress, a Performance Appraisal, um, and the author of a lot of other writings uh, on American political institutions. Um, second, we'll hear from Molly Reynolds. She's a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. Molly particularly studies Congress, and especially with an emphasis on how rules and procedures affect policy outcomes in Congress. Um, she's the author of, of a great book about the filibuster in the Senate, and also supervises the Brookings-run project called Vital Statistics on Congress, which is much beloved by all students of the institution. And finally, we'll hear from Kevin Kosar. Uh, Kevin is Vice President for Policy at R Street, and also the co-director of the Nonpartisan Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. Kevin worked for years at the Congressional Research Service, so you're welcome, as he goes around saying. Um, and he's written a number of books, but Kevin's, uh, your favorite, uh, my favorite of your books is Whiskey, A Global History, which I highly recommend, <laughs> and which must have involved some grueling research, uh, <laughs> book published in 2010. Uh, each will offer some thoughts, uh, Andy will take us a little bit through the argument of this essay, we'll hear from, uh, from Molly and Kevin on their thoughts about the general subject. And then we'll take some questions uh, from me, from one another, uh, and from all of you as well. Uh, and so let's start. Andy, please. Yeah, thank you, Yuval. Um, thank you, National Affairs. Thank you, Austria, uh, for hosting us here today. Um, I, the genesis of this idea of, of permanent appropriation, which, is, which I'll explore in a second, but the genesis of this idea of permanent appropriation comes from sort of three interests that I have that are kind of personal and professional. Um, like most Americans, um, well, not most Americans, most Americans are un, uh, don't know much about the congressional budget process, but like most of uh, people who do um, uh, focus on and, and study and look at the congressional budget process, I'm, I'm sort of frustrated by the state of affairs. Um, most people believe that the uh, architecture that was put in place in 1974 is broken. Um, in many, many different ways. Um, and of course, the process that we have currently, to the extent that there is a d divinable process, um, clearly does not resemble anything like uh, that w that was uh, built in 1974 or that even sort of evolved uh, for the next 20 years. Um, so that was a, that's one concern that attracted me to this and, and, and this idea of coming appropriations. Secondly is an intellectual one. Um, I have a sort of uh, professional interest in Congress, as Duval <coughs> hinted out. I've written uh, quite extensively, um, both uh, for uh, academic uh, audiences and, and popular audiences on the inst uh, institution of Congress. Um, and I'm particularly interested in policy change in Congress. Um, and I've been, uh, not just me, many of us in political science have been thinking about this 
uh, in many different ways over many decades, um, particularly through a sort of spatial lens and this idea, um, thinking about con con uh, congressional policy change uh, in terms of um, uh, what political science calls uh, status quo points and reversion points, um, by which we mean uh, where policy is currently, that obviously is the status quo, a reversion point is what will happen if uh, we have inaction. And of course, for most pieces of legislation, the re status quo point and the reversion point are the same. Uh, but that's not the case with appropriations, and I'll explore that more in a little bit. Um, and then the third one is sort of more kind of political and ideological, and, and that is, uh, like many people, perhaps everybody in this room, uh, there are some of us who are concerned with the uh, state of uh, fiscal health of this country and uh, the, the nature of uh, deficits and the accumulated debt that we have. Um, and although, of course, you know, entitlement spending is largely to blame for this, um, discretionary spending um, isn't small potatoes either these days. It, Sort of roughly 30% of a $4.4 trillion budget. Um, and so this concern um, and need to get hold of deficit and debt also drives this. And I've come to the conclusion that, um, you know, we, we've obviously been trying to get a handle on this for some time, but I've come to the conclusion that procedures like caps and sequestration and PAYGO uh, that we've been doing since the mid 1980s doesn't really work. It uh, doesn't seem like unified Republican government works either uh, to get a handle on this, and so that also drew me to this, this idea of permanent appropriations. All right, so what are permanent appropriations? Well, it's, I think it can be pretty simple, um, and that is that Congress would pass a law or laws at some point in time, um, appropriating funds um, for what it does uh, for multiple years, um, or maybe even in perpetuity. Um, it could do this in any way it wanted, I suppose. It could include it through the sort of existing 12 appropriations bills. Um, and it could do it at any level. Um, current levels seem to be arbitrary, but fairly defensible um, level to do it. Um, the Treasury would then release funds uh, on October 1st every year at those levels um, to the departments and agencies for them to spend. Um, and that those levels could be changed um, at any time uh, by law. Um, uh, again, possibly using the current process or some other process. Uh, I'll talk about why I think that's a good idea in a moment, but it's a pretty simple idea, right? And, and of course, what it get, where it really sort of um, uh, blows up the current appropriations process is to get a r away from this idea of an annual cycle. But there would not be uh, an annual appropriations process. Um, it would be, as I said, uh, uh, permanent. So the first question would be, is this constitutional? Um, what does the Constitution say it's, uh, about the uh, rhythm of the appropriations process. After all, for those of you historians out there, might know the the Republic. Um, and by the time we get into the late 19th century, that uh, annual process had been institutionalized, but it was further entrenched when the uh, appropriations and authorization processes were separated um, and the appropriations committees uh, in Congress were established. Um, so it's the way that we've always done it, and obviously it has uh, tremendous uh, legitimacy as a result. But nothing, in fact, mandates it. Um, we do already have, by the way, as you, many of you might know, multi-year appropriations. Entitlements really are multi-year appropriations. Uh, the money is, <laughs> we use the term authorized, but I mean, as far as constitutional language is concerned, the money is granted by Congress to, for the Treasury to spend. And then obviously amounts are uh, vary over the course of time based upon authorized formulae. Uh, but that could be seen as a multi-year appropriations. And in fact, some entitlement programs, um, for example, the state grant part of Medicaid, um, SNAP, uh, 
um, are, are subject to actual formal appropriations on an annual basis, even though the amounts that are appropriated are determined again by formulae um, and a tied to uh, a, a predetermined authorization. Entitlement programs, of course, the administration functions for conventional annual appropriations, uh, but the implication is that that money is always going to be there because without administration, the transfer payments don't occur. So, the, you know, you can already think about the fact that we have uh, multi-year, um, uh, long time horizon, almost permanent appropriations. Also, with regards to whether this is constitutional or not, the, co the courts uh, have determined, and I want to talk about uh, something that happened yesterday in a moment, but the courts have largely determined that Congress can do what it wants with regards to appropriations. Um, and there's a, quite a lot of case law on this, um, much of which stems back to the 1970s and actually was the genesis for the Congressional Budget Act in 1974, the empowerment battles between Congress and the Nixon administration, courts uh, looking into those, um, uh, during the uh, legal disputes over Obamacare, um, one of the Obamacare cases, the Harris versus Burwell case, the uh, 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 Federal Circuit Court uh, ruled that the uh, cost-sharing subsidies that went to insurers were unconstitutional because they weren't a congressional appropriation. Um, the courts have largely said that Congress can do whatever it wants in terms of um, managing its appropriations process. Now, many of you might have seen uh, the district court judge's decision yesterday um, regarding the uh, House's case against the Trump administration with, the, with regards to the um, redirection of the, def the Defense Department funds to, for the administration uh, to, to build the wall, which is, of course, as you know, all about the, the government shutdown earlier on in the year. Um, judge McFadden said that uh, he ruled that the, ca the, the, the issue was politically unjusticiable. I don't think he ru ruled definitively, of course, as a lower court judge, he couldn't rule really definitively on this matter of whether, court, of whether Congress controls the appropriations process or not. But I think people are still fairly confident that Congress, the House, will win that case um, <coughs> as it makes its way through the process. I think the main constitutional obstacle to this is in Article 1, Section 8, which states that Congress, um, uh, of course, has the uh, authority to uh, support and raise armies, but no appropriation of money to, the, to that use shall be made for a longer term than two years. So this could be an issue with regard, and we can talk about how to get around that, I have some ideas to get around that, but this could be a, 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 a problem with regards to defense spending specifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, for this permanent appropriations regime um, going forward. And that, of course, is connected to the, the, the founders' concerns about standing armies. Uh, but we'll, can, we can talk a little bit about that maybe in q and All right, so what would the effects be? Um, this is, the, the, there are, as many of you know, and this probably will come into Molly and Kevin's remarks, um, uh, of our charges more broadly to talk about budget reform rather than this specific proposal. But as many of you know, there are a myriad of different proposals out there uh, currently uh, uh, about reforming the budget. A biennial budget's been kicking around for a long time. Making the budget resolution law uh, is, is something that's been talked about. Um, there are, of course, a myriad of uh, automatic uh, continuing resolution proposals out there. Uh, you know, many of them name things like End Government Shutdown Act or something along those lines. Uh, there are proposals that many conservatives are sort of um, uh, coalescing around uh, that I've called capping and pegging, which would cap spending or peg spending to certain levels, such as some measures of GDP, Representative Brady's um, legislation does that, um, or revenues. Um, there are a lot of economists who have talked about capping <laughs> spending to revenues. But uh, let me talk finally, as I wrap up, about some... Um, virtues of uh, permanent appropriations that some um, of those, maybe many of those proposals don't share and therefore sort of uh, making a case for permanent appropriations perhaps in conjunction with some of those uh, reforms or maybe instead of some of those reforms.
the first gets the, gets us back to this idea of status quo and reversion bits. So one of the things um, uh, permanent preparations does, which capping and pegging, capping and pegging proposals and automatic continuing resolution proposals do not do is to make the status quo and reversion point the same. Um, one of the things that, that I think is good about permanent appropriations is that it gets us away from this drastic zero reversion point. Uh, that is, if we don't pass appropriations bills, the world comes to an end, the government shuts down, this world doesn't come to an end, the government shuts down, and this is terrible, and as a result, we need to get something done. And I think the political science literature does, uh, a lot of the political science literature, a lot of the, the, the work on Congress shows that, if anything, this pr places pressure, in, uh, upward pressure on spending, rather than downward pressure on spending. Um, and permanent appropriations, of course, says it doesn't matter uh, if you don't pass appropriations bills, because it, the money is already there. And capping and pegging and ACRs do get away with zero dollar reversion points, but they still have, particularly over a period of time, and particularly ACRs over a period of time, do create drastic reversions that I think create overall upward pressure on spending in a way that permanent appropriations don't. Permanent appropriations also, unlike capping and pegging and ACRs, I think have legitimate that is, Congress has already created these spending levels. Capping and pegging and ACRs create artificial, critics would say, uh, spending levels that have not been form formally gone through the congressional process, the lawmaking process, and therefore lack a certain amount of, uh, of legitimacy. Um, and I think permanent appropriations also, by talking, by by putting uh, or, or really making appropriations policy incremental or static mean that when people do want to change level spending levels, the focus is really sort of politics on the actual mm -hmm. substance of the appropriations uh, bill itself rather than being uh, sort of a bigger uh, discussion about fundamental, the fundamental scope of, of uh, federal government about um, ideological, uh, fiscal, and budgetary principles um, that often lead to deadlock. Uh, those can go on outside of the appropriations process now. They're extremely important, of course, but they allow discussions to be more about the actual value of the money that we're spending rather than some of these hot button political issues. Permanent appropriations would obviously make planning much more easy for departments and agencies than the current process would, which is, of course, obviously full of continuing resolutions and um, uh, stopgap spending and shutdowns. Um, uh, uh, th that would be a, a tremendous advantage. Um, it would also enable them to get rid of a lot of the sort of year-end spending sprees that we've been seeing as well, which don't get a lot of attention. I don't even think on the Hill, but a lot of departments and agencies, um, you know, trying to get money out of the door very quickly, that's not the most uh, intelligent and strategic use of, of taxpayer resources. And then it would, I think, hand power back more to authorizers right, and, and away from appropriators and create a kind of balance between authorization and appropriations that we haven't had. You know, obviously at the moment authorizers are sort of play second fiddle to appropriators. Um, the authorization process is, in, in the aggregate, is a mess. Uh, we've got multi-year authorizations. We've got no authorizations, right, um, for some programs like Head Start and Light Heat, et cetera. Um, and even when we have annual authorizations uh, for matters like defense, it still seems to me and many people that the appropriators are really pulling the strings rather than the authorizers. Uh, if we could, if we went to permanent appropriations, authorizers could really come back on into the in, into the show. Um, they could focus on things like program evaluation, 
right? And the way that funds are being spent, um, rather than having to worry too much about how they can influence the level of spending, um, I think that will give them, 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 them greater um, power. Um, and so I think that's, a, again, by bringing uh, authorizers uh, uh, back into doing a meaningful <coughs> work, um, undermining the power, obviously, of appropriators, but I think that that would be a positive effect of uh, a system of permanent appropriations. And I think I've got to my limit, um, my charge from Yuval was to talk for 15 to 20 minutes. I think they, they did that, so I yield. Right. Thanks very much. <laughs> Molly, please. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I thought what I would do with my time is take a couple of um, sort of themes that I think come out of Andy's essay and talk about kind of what they tell us about why uh, there are a lot of challenges in trying to reform the budget process. So one of them is this idea that in 1974, the current budget process that we have was designed to be outcome neutral. So it was designed to be a process that could accommodate higher levels of spending or lower levels of spending. It could accommodate increases to taxes. It could accommodate cuts to taxes. Um, one of the things that um, Andy discusses both in the essay and talked a little bit about in his opening comments is the way in which we've gotten to a process now that he argues disadvantages fiscal hawks, disadvantages um, individuals who would prefer to see lower levels, particularly of um, discretionary spending. And I, um, so as we sort of think about what budget process reform might look like, we really have to grapple with this question. Of, do we want to continue to live in a world that's um, designed to have an outcome neutral process? Or in changes in our political system that we've seen since the process was designed in the early 70s, is that really an unattainable goal at this point? Um, can, have we gotten to a point where we can't really have um, an outcome neutral process? Um, I don't, I personally don't think that's true. I think we, we can still make changes to the budget process that would make it work better that don't privilege one kind of outcomes over the other. But I think that that's a really central big question that we have to grapple with. Um, the second um, question that I think we really need to answer is um, sort of in two parts. One is how much of the problem is actually the appropriations process itself? And as sort of an addendum to that, what do we really want the appropriations process to be? So when we look at kind of the reasons why we often say that the appropriations process doesn't work well, um, I think a number of um, the uh, things that folks point to aren't necessarily um, problems with the appropriations process itself. They're problems with the degree to which the appropriations process, because in many cases, it's the only part of the legislative process moves on a regular uh, basis every year, has come to bear um, much of the political uh, burden that Congress has. So, you know, members of Congress come to Washington with goals of various kinds, policy goals, political goals, and they sort of want to pursue those goals. They, they have things they want to take, they have things they want to try and get done, and when there's really no other mechanism in the legislative process to try to get those things done, because there's less, there's more gridlock overall, there's less legislating happening, they turn to the, the place where uh, there is the legislating and increasingly that's the appropriations process. Even if that means, you know, we have um, one big omnibus spending bill, we have continuing resolutions, there are, we can look for many examples of where we see this happening. Um, I think the, uh, the example that brought us the 35 day government shutdown uh, in December and January is a, is a good one. The idea that much of that fight was about immigration and about a very one very specific question about immigration policy, and not really about the overall levels um, of spending that were uh, in those deliveries. Not to say that there wasn't disagreement about that, but the the degree to which the appropriations process um, is being asked to bear broader political conflict, I think, is a is a challenge that we have to confront um, as as we go forward. I think we also have to ask ourselves what parts of the appropriations process are um, really broken. So it's, I think, easy to, to sort of paint this with a broad brush. I know I do it myself um, sometimes. But we really need to think, you know, what parts still work well, what parts don't. Um, and so if you, for example, look at the process by which appropriations bills are generated, um, that by and large 
discussions um, in both the House and the Senate at the committee level with subcommittees developing proposals, marking them up, having full committees mark them up, not exclusively. We've seen some drop off in that. We've seen some decline in the number of hearings that appropriations committees have. But I think if we want to think about how to change the appropriations process, uh, we really need to interrogate what parts of it aren't working well and what parts uh, could be working better. And then um, the last uh, sort of big challenge of reform that I'll point to is the ever-present challenge that Congress really does not do work that it does not have a reason to do. Um, in this way, Congress is like, you know, you, when you were in third grade and you didn't really want to do your homework. Um, and so when keeping that in mind and thinking, um, again, perhaps about Andy's permanent appropriations proposal, we have to ask ourselves, if we move to a, a system with different incentives for Congress to act, what would it do? And so I think that um, there's real oversight value in a more regular appropriations process. I think having um, hearings with agency and executive branch officials um, is an important uh, tool for congressional oversight. The idea that that might happen less frequently because there isn't an annual appropriations process I think is a challenge. Um, the ability of to <coughs> adjust uh, spending priorities on an annual basis is, a, again, a really important feature of the annual appropriations process. Um, and in an ideal world, we might imagine that Congress would choose to do that even in a system of permanent appropriations that have a different reversal <coughs> point. But I've watched enough um, of Congress to know that um, Congress often requires um, something to force them, uh, them to act. And then I, the last thing I would say on this, this front is that when we think about sort of entitlement spending and how we got to the place where we are with entitlement spending, I think many folks would argue that the, the one of the biggest challenges with entitlement spending is that it can continue unchecked and that Congress doesn't um, has no incentive to make hard political choices to change it. And so how Congress would sort of decide to do that in a system of more permanent appropriations, I think is also an important question to ask. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Kevin. All right. <coughs> well, I uh, enjoyed Professor Taylor's article. It's interesting, provocative, uh, as most things in national affairs are. And I'm delighted to be co-hosting the event with, uh, with National Affairs and discussing this. And for those of you who didn't get copies, um, the article is online, both HTML and PDF. Just Google it, you'll find it. I'm going to break my comments into uh, three, four, four points, roughly. Um, so first, I fully sympathize with Professor Taylor's remarks that the budget process is broken. Our deficits and debts are astronomical. The budget resolution, as he notes, uh, is frequent and rarely used as intended. See reconciliation, classic example. The shutdown dramas, the debt ceiling brinkmanship, the governing via CRs, and the multi-thousand page spending bills are all indication that things are not going so well, and certainly not as intended by the crafters of the 74 Budget Act. I agree with him that we need to think big about budget reform. Uh, a few years ago, I, in fact, argued an essay for Politico that we should consider abolishing the budget, budget resolution. I just was looking at the situation and thought the amount of work that goes into that thing and the amount of good that comes out of it just didn't seem to weigh out well on the scale. <coughs> Second, a huge problem that Congress has with budgeting is caused by the growth of government. We have more than 170 federal agencies, and each year most of them come to Congress asking for more money. Enacting annual appropriations is a task that has dominated Congress's <coughs> calendar increasingly, and it crowds out other important work. Oversight, reauthorizing appropriations, responding to public problems. Uh, the appropriations process has become the vehicle for a lot of legislating because people feel like, well, we got to get these bills passed, so we might as well jam stuff into those. More government has meant more budgeting work for Congress. Now, that could be fixed by downsizing government, but to date, we've not seen a whole lot of appetite on Capitol Hill to do that sort of thing. <coughs> so there's something quite intriguing about enacting permanent appropriations, which would remove a huge load uh, from Congress's to-do list each year and free them up to spend the time otherwise. Of course, as Molly indicates, how they might spend that time may not be exactly as we desire. This brings me to my third point, 
we were to move to a system of permanent appropriations, would that mean that we've effectively, not in principle, but effectively have given up on budgeting? Recall that a budget is an itemized summary of expected expenditures and estimated income. The purposes of budgeting are multiple. They include setting and resetting of governmental priorities, the deliberative allocations of resources towards these purposes, and the management of the overall finances of the government. Doing that, I would think, would require far more than simply enacting uh, a dozen spending bills and letting them run of their own forever and hope that there is you know, amendments to these bills along the way and amendments to the tax law. So a question I would have for Professor Taylor and the panel in the room is, can we square the objectives, to say nothing of the processes, of budgeting with the enactment of permanent appropriations across the board? I myself honestly don't know. Finally, I, uh, you know, again, I said the article was provocative, and the article spurred me to think about an even larger point about federal, federal budgeting, uh, which we all might want to chew over. And that's what role in our separation of power system should the president and legislature play in budgeting? The 74 Congressional Budget Act reduced the president to arguably a, a clerk and a veto player. His budget goes to Congress, it's often ignored. Congress, when it adopts a resolution, which it dec decreasingly does, doesn't send it to the president for a signature. In short, the whole budget process feels to me not particularly well coordinated, and certainly the results seem to be increasingly bad, and it's not clear who shoulders the blame. There's a lot of finger pointing, uh, and voters don't know where to turn. So, as I think about this mess that we're in right now, I think about our separate system as opposed to a parliamentary system, I'm not really sure how a legislator, which is increasingly pluralistic and which is heavily set upon by interest groups and government agencies <coughs> who come with hat in hand and demand particular types of spending, and a legislature which represents an immense nation whose citizens pay scarcely any attention to budgeting mm -hmm. or spending. How is that legislature structurally able to competently lead on setting budget priorities and do that on an annual basis? Can it really do that? So with that, I'd like to conclude my remarks. Turn over to the ball. All right. Well, thanks to all three of you. Uh, great <coughs> comments and very provocative comments. I definitely want to open it up to the room. I wonder if we could start, Andy, with a response from you to what I take to be a common thread in both sets of comments, which is maybe something like, if, if Congress doesn't spend all its time on appropriations, what is Congress actually going to do? And uh, <laughs> don't, we, don't we run the risk that, in fact, the answer to that is nothing, and that <laughs> members spend their time just hanging out in cable television studios, which seems to be what they want to do when they can do whatever they choose. That might not necessarily be a terrible thing. A lot of people would think, but but no, I I I, I, under, I understand the sort of premise of the question. Um, with with regards to sort of budgeting generally, you know, politics is about a number of things, but essentially it's about the distribution of resources. Um, and I suspect that members of Congress would still be extremely interested. Um, in this matter, which is essentially what, what budgeting it is. So uh, for those who are interested in sort of appropriations, by which I sort of think about the lawmaker who's uh, interested in um, what this political scientists would call distributive politics, or pork barrel spending, um, they still would uh, spend a lot of time uh, focusing on appropriations. Um, uh, that may be now in the form of trying to get appropriations bills passed, um, which can be done at any time um, uh, to change existing spending laws. Um, it's just now that the onus is on them to go out um, and form majority coalitions um, to pass appropriations bills on the floor, rather than wait for the cycle uh, to deliver them uh, a moment where everybody is, uh, they, they're able to put a revolver to everybody else's heads and say, give us an appropriations bill now. Um, I think another positive thing about this would be that I, I think you, you might get 
and I hinted at this in my, in, in, my, in my remarks, you might get a sort of bifurcated debate about things budgetary. And so uh, appropriations would be sort of stripped out a little bit about these broader, uh, more sort of fundamental questions about what the federal government should be doing, how, how it should be, how it should be um, diverting and spending, investing taxpayer resources. Um, and how it should uh, fund um, what most uh, Americans would consider uh, matters that they're not concerned with. Um, and that should be dealt with in a sort of more technical, uh, um, non-partisan, unideological, uh, and perhaps even administrative way. I mean, it'd still be legislative, but they think about those processes in those terms. Um, so, I, I really don't think that Congress would be doing that. Um, uh, it would actually create more um, sort of typical lawmaking um, and, and place the onus on those who want to change status quo policy to actually go through the regular legislative process rather than, as I said, wait for whatever metaphor you want to use, someone putting a gun to, uh, to Congress's head and say, now you have to, to legislate. Well, uh, let's open things up and see if people have questions, and we can also uh, have more from the panel as we go. Please, right here. Um, along with the annual um, appropriations process, it's not just Congress. Before every, anything goes to Congress, right, the, the President's budget is comprised of uh, agencies' thorough review, hopefully thorough review, of their programs and their spendings um, and their new request levels. And uh, my understanding is that the annual appropriations process is sort of like it lights a fire under the agency's butts to say you need to review your processes and justify to the purse string holders why you deserve, you continue to deserve this money. So with a, uh, with a permanent appropriations process, where does that accountability mechanism go? Well, I th it's up to Congress to do it. Um, and uh, at the moment what happens is that the, 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 uh, the agencies and departments go through that exercise, as you said, but it's a bit of a charade. Um, they go through it and then think there will be an appropriation at the end of the day. More likely than not, it will be north of what we have in this particular year. At the, at the end of the day, after disruption through, uh, you know, uh, through a CR, a series of CRs, we don't know what date we're gonna get money, uh, we'll get some, it'll keep us going by for a little bit of time and then maybe you know, halfway through the fiscal year we'll get more. Um, here, if they want more, they're gonna have to make a justification for it. They're gonna have to get congressional champions for it. Um, they're able, gonna be able to plan uh, uh, with some certainty um, or greater certainty than they have currently. Uh, of what money they'll have in the next fiscal year. I mean, for those of you who know a little bit about the procurement process, procurement is moving in this direction anyway uh, because what the federal government buys now is increasingly uh, sophisticated. It's increasingly based on human capital rather than tangible goods. And the commitments it's making to vendors are getting longer and longer and longer. Um, and so we're thinking, on the procurement side, a lot of people are thinking more in terms of, of a broader time horizon uh, because they need to give vendors greater certainty. Um, they're planning in those ways. Why not do that um, in all that agencies and departments do with all the resources um, that they have? Um, so, you know, again, it's an empirical question <laughs> uh, because in a world, as Molly sort of hints at, that we're unlikely to get to, so we're never perhaps going to be able to test this proposition, but my, my hunch is that, that you will have this accountability. It will just take uh, different forms. Uh, about the... Well, why don't you tell us who you are also before? My name is Ali. I'm a former student professor of Paul Hazavait. I'm a lawyer from Brazil. And exactly, Brazil adopts this concept. And so this, let's say that this is a positive budget that is automatic, even enshrined in the Constitution. 
what the Congress does is exactly the opposite. They start, as soon you have that, you start to work how you defeat the, the automatic appropriation, because through time this provokes some distortion in the budget in general, especially because you, you, can, you can fix the, the, the appropriation, but you cannot fix the revenue. So actually you create imbalance. You can't fix the, you can fix the appropriation, but you can't fix the what? The revenue. Oh, the revenue. The revenue. And because it depends of not only the, the, the taxes itself, <laughs> but the economic cycles. The problem that we, we, we try to solve and we fail miserably in economic is to, to do some kind of indexation to some factors. And actually, every single country in Latin America who did that end up with hyperinflation. So they destroy their own economies with it. And to be very fair, I heard this be mentioned yesterday by Guterres about the, the minimum wage, because the minimum wage had not been uh, uh, um, actualized right. at this moment. And now you said that there is, get, there is people who are saying that to do this the same with the budget, which actually I think is extremely dangerous because the results are, I cannot see them. But, so but what yeah, I mean, uh, permanent appropriations aren't permanent, <coughs> right? The, the, what they, the, they're, they're in many ways, you can look at it the other way. At least, I mean, at least the agencies and departments are guaranteed revenue in perpetuity. What if we decided that government shutdowns were great and we just had one forever, right? We, I mean, I, 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 the premise of, the, of, the, of this is that that's not feasible and, and that's what's creating upward pressure. But in theory, Congress could do that, uh, hypothetically. Whereas here, the default is you are, as an agency or department, you are guaranteed your appropriation. So, um, obviously, there are, you know the, the, a lot of the motivation here is because I want downward pressure on the budget, and now the onus is on Congress to pass legislation in order to increase appropriations through the regular lawmaking process, just like any other law. Appropriations, of course, are unique in this regard because the reversion point is zero and not to the status quo. But Congress could do what it, it can still do what it wants. Um, for those of you who worry about constraints on spending, have confidence that Congress will still probably par, even pass appropriations bills that increase spending. You seem to think that, that, that that's not going to happen. I, I think this is actually, going back to the sort of neutral point that Molly said, I think this is as outcome neutral as you can get. I think the current system is clearly not outcome neutral. Because of the drastic zero dollar reversion point, it is biased in favor of increased spending. Um, it, it's interesting that there is this sort of feel that feeling that, you know, this, this is going to be the end of the world. This, the, the end of the world is much closer with the current system that we have. Even for those of you who want to see the, the, the reach of go federal government expand and appropriations generally increase. Molly, Kevin, I so I guess I, this might be repeating something that I said already, but I am um, I am always skeptical that Congress is going to take active steps to change the status quo. Um, I think we one uh, way I, mean, I think we see that now, and I think we would see that if we sort of moved to this system. And so I I am much more. Pessimistic, optimistic, I'm not sure. I'm much more skeptical than you are that Congress would choose to take active steps to revise permanent appropriations once they were set in place. But I actually think this question of how and um, if and how to index permanent appropriations <coughs> to broader change in the economy, inflation, what have you, is a really, a really important one. Um, would you be in favor of that? I mean, what about so a permanent 5% increase or a permanent indexing? It's a similar, same procedural principle, but here obviously we're going to increase spending every year, but, but with congressional inaction. So I think that um, I think the I, the, um, uh, the you know, creating some kind of um, index and adjustment for inflation would be important. It's one of the principal 
objections that I personally have to things like automatic continuing resolutions that don't adjust for inflation, because then it incentivizes folks who don't want more spending just to keep holding out for um, and let the, the auto CR go on longer and longer and erode the value um, of the spending. Um, I think the, the challenge, um, and I don't know very much about the Brazil case or um, cases in, in Latin America, is sort of what's the, what are the broader economic consequences of setting that? But, but, but even, if you, even if you had a, an, an automatic, an ACR, um, which would uh, increase appropriations um, by a certain amount, capping them, uh, pegging them to some kind of indicator that, 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 um, that uh, leads to increases annually across time. That's still the same procedure. That's still the function of but congressional it also, inaction. But it also still loses one of the things that I think is most important about the current approach, which is the ability of Congress on a regular basis to be presented with an incentive to revisit what they have and make adjustments based on changes and changing policy priorities. Okay, so it is, the it is the procedure rather than the, 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 the outcome bias in that case that's problematic. Um, it's the... I mean, I think that, uh, again, I think a really important part of the appropriations process is the ability to make adjustments on a regular basis. And I'd be, I'd be quite worried about losing that with the shift to funding appropriations. Let's take another question. Uh, please, in the back. Um, Tell us who you are. My name is James D'Angelo. I research Congress, um, David King of Harvard. Um, you mentioned in your article that legislators have a terrible fear uh, of being put on record for most budgetary concerns. And you talk about how in 2011, they massively increased the transparency of the voting in the House. Um, and the budget, as you know, starts going out of control in the mid-70s when the House pushes almost all committees into the public. Um, and legislators themselves, <coughs> excuse me, have suggested that uh, by opening the votes, it's put up with pressure on the budget, so everyone passes everything. Um, would you care to comment about how maybe pushing yeah. this back into secret committees, so no benefit at all to the public, might help? That's an interesting question. I think a lot of, and Molly, would know, Molly and Kevin would know more about this than, than me, just being here on a, on a daily basis and, and understanding some low-level kinds of proposals that, that are circulated around in, on the Hill. But it's my understanding that there are, there, is a, 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 there are a group of people, maybe including members and staffers, but certainly within those people who observe Congress and, and are interested in Congress, that these kinds of re reversal of these kinds of reforms, um, creating a greater amount, maybe what you might consider opacity, and moving away from transparency might be helpful to people who are in the fiscal hawk camp. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether it would be. I mean, obviously, I, I, I would expect a lot of us in this room would have um, would, would have problems with that from for other reasons other than the, the fact that it may be outcome biased in a in a way that we don't like, because um, we, we generally like transparency. <coughs> um, but it may well be true, you know, that they can they can take these more uh, th these positions that may be unpopular uh, with constituents, um, uh, which can generally uh, involve fiscal constraint rather than fiscal expansion um, when they uh, can credibly claim I didn't do it. But I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about that. Visibility the problem? I, uh, no, I think it, I mean, it's a topic we're all, we're thinking more about um, and thinking about where in the process visibility and invisibility, the, the traceability, as our Douglas Arnold called it, um, affects outcomes. I will say that one of the ironies is that the 74 Budget Act, those who are crafting it, um, they supposed that by forcing aggregates for government spending to be reported in one place each year, that it would actually create a disincentive for members to vote for deficits. Mm -hmm. And just didn't work out that way. 
you want anyone in my way or do we have to go back to the audience? Um, we can go back to the audience. All right. All right. Let's take another question. <coughs> uh, yeah, please, back there. Um, you told us to have Again, tell us who you are. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm from the National Commission on Military, um, National and Public Service. Uh, you told us to have faith in Congress. How can we have faith in Congress when Congress fails to deal with entitlement entitlement programs that presents you know, a huge problem in certain sense? Um, and some of the some of the programs like Social Security are became so untouchable they're considered the third rail of American politics. How yeah, and uh, obviously. For people who are concerned about um, deficits and debt, fiscal hawks among us, entitlements is where the money is. Um, and uh, any, uh, um, I don't know if serious is the right word, I'd like to think this is serious. And you, could, you could enact permanent appropriations, obviously, without even thinking about entitlement reform. Uh, but any real concerted effort to get handle on um, the debt uh, in the long term requires entitlement reform. Um, and, you know, I think every, what, there are 50, 50 of us in this room, there are probably 50 ideas about how to do that. Um, this really doesn't touch on it, uh, but doesn't preclude it, right? I mean, it, you know, it, 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 uh, for those of you, including myself, who are, are interested in entitlement reform, could enact it alongside permanent appropriations regime. Cap Scott with the Epic Times, uh, and speaking as a journalist, we love transparency. <laughs> I'm struck by two things. Andrew, you pointed out that Congress still has the basic power to control spending. And Molly, you noted that 70% of the spending is entitlements, but there's no, no incentive for Congress to address that. Is there something intrinsic about entitlement spending that is the problem, and if that's the case, then all of these things that we've been concerned about, shutdowns and CRs and so forth, are manifestations of the problem, the effects of the problem. The real problem is entitlement spending, as Robert suggested. So I think one major challenge in addressing entitlement spending, I'll note before I start, is that We've talked a lot about entitlement spending. We've talked a lot about discretionary spending. We've talked very little about the revenue side of the budget. Right. Um, so I don't, uh, and the, the degree to which um, that also plays into our long-term fiscal picture. But um, on, the, on the entitlement piece, um, I think the biggest challenge that Congress faces in uh, addressing um, entitlement programs is that they are politically popular and that they are programs that, you know, by the name entitlement, are structured so that people come to depend on the existence of benefits coming to them and they expect them. Um, and so, you know, you see, you know, don't touch my Medicare, don't touch my Social Security. And the, so the political realities of programs that um, are intended to deliver specific benefits to specific individuals, uh, the, the challenge in making any changes to those is that people, voters, are going to be very skeptical of um, what it means mm -hmm. for them in the short term. Um, this is why I think most of the time when we talk about entitlement reform, we talk about sort of enacting change now and having it take effect in the future and just hoping that the future Congress decides it's gonna <laughs> let that go into effect. Uh, but I mean, that's the, it's a, for me it's a fundamentally, it's a political challenge. Um, entitlements are permanent appropriation, I, I use the analogy, right? Um, it, it, it effectively, if we get, you know, the, the, the founders would probably say that's a permanent appropriation. They wouldn't think in terms, of, they just think in terms of government spending um, and revenues. They don't think in terms of categories like appropriations and, or, or discretionary spending and, and entitlement or mandatory spending. Um, but the reason why they go up is uh, because unlike permanent appropriations, uh, the level is determined by a pre-authorized formula and of course increasingly um, as the population grows fall into particular increasingly numbers of people fall into particular categories of beneficiaries so the amount spent uh, within those programs naturally increases but the principle is the same you, we can change entitlements just as we could change permanent appropriations getting majorities on the house and senate floor to pass legislation yes I know the senate 
uh, sent off. And you need super majorities, and that's a, something that we haven't talked about. You should, you should um, read Molly's book for more on that. Um, but uh, getting majorities and getting um, presidents to sign bills or getting two thirds in both the House and Senate to override vetoes, Congress can do whatever it wants. Um, and so it's just a will. Uh, that Congress needs uh, to, to grapple entitlement spending. But as for many reasons that, that Molly gave, that will just doesn't exist currently. And you think this, the, 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 this idea would create that will where it now doesn't exist? Uh, if, if, a if applied to entitlements? If or, in general. I mean, if the problem is yeah. members don't want Yeah, no, I think, I mean, that's why I said I think it's m uh, incredibly outcome neutral in a way that Molly clearly doesn't. I think that members of Congress kind of like spending <laughs> um, uh, for reasons, you know, uh, whether it be uh, obviously in the open air, but I think sometimes they even like it in secret. Perhaps less so, but they still like it in secret. But now the onus is on them to create majorities in the House and Senate, to get presidents to, rather than have this process whereby if we don't do something, um, and the natural inclination to to, 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 to increase spending uh, uh, comes to for, comes comes forth, then we're all jumping off a cliff. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, in the back there. Um, if I may, a couple of comments and a thought experiment. Um, Tell us who first, you are. Too. Yeah. First of all, this all starts because the most important power of Congress is the public. And to the degree they give that up, whether they do a continuing resolution, a minibus, an omnibus pack it all in the end with 12 people in a room who make all the decisions for everybody else, it hurts Congress and Congress's powers, which is their balance, the most important balance of power. Um, what I what concerns me about Professor Taylor's idea is that it allows Congress to do what they do very well. Avoid a problem. Just not vote, let her go. We're pretty good at doing that already, and I'm concerned that that will be the case. I think I would take uh, uh, issue with Molly on, on the budget Budget Act of 1974 got through because Richard Nixon was very weak. The Congress saw an opportunity. They wanted to stop his impoundment right. of money. And they wanted to create a system which created ever higher spending, particularly for domestic spending. And they created a Budget Act with continuing services that always goes up. The other thing they were looking at, remember the timing of this, was the Vietnam War. They wanted to reduce defense spend. And they created a, a budget process that actually did that. It favors more and more spending, particularly domestic spending, every year. Um, now, my thought experiment is this. I don't think we spend too much time on appropriations. I think we spend too little time and at the wrong time of the year. When you're up against the deadline of October 1st, what happens is that the number of people involved goes down and down and down. And it gives enormous advantage to appropriators, particularly cardinals, and leadership to work out something with whoever in the White House or OMB they have to work with. And they get more and more and more problems get hidden and shuffled away back and forth. What if you would start the appropriations process and say no legislative action can take place on the floor of the House or the Senate? Well, you can't because we'll do the House. The Senate's a whole different deal we'll have to work out. But if the House starts this, I think the Senate has to follow that you cannot take up any bills until all appropriations are passed, and it would take a 75% vote of the House to waive that. It cannot be waived any other way but 75%, because if, if there's something so important you have to do it in a matter of catastrophe or something else, you'll get 75% of the vote. Otherwise, you'll never get 75% of the vote, in my opinion. So that you, fa in fact, focus on the most important job of Congress, appropriations, for, until you get them done. And Good. this yeah. will leave time for other committees to, for example, look at oversight, or if they want to look at, uh, at reforming Medicare, reforming Social Security, or whatever else, they'll have time to do that because it's the Appropriations Committee that's working real hard to get these things out so everybody looks at them, has a chance on the floor to vote on different amendments they might, might want to vote on. If yeah, we shuffle this around, do we not then re regain for Congress the power of the appropriations process? Just a, just a quick observation. My sense is that that creates, again, such a drastic reversion point. Um, it's not a government shutdown, but it is, you know, basically saying we won't be able to do anything until we appropriate. 
that again, <laughs> we get back to this idea of outcome neutrality, um, I, I think that, that loads the dice again in favor of upward drift, which of course some people are in favor of, but I'm not. Um, and again, I don't understand why, just have a regular process. The, the, the rest of everything else that Congress does is subject to this idea that the, world, the, the status quo exists until we change it, except for appropriations. When the status quo exists for a while until September the 30th, and then the world explodes in, in the case of inaction, why not make appropriations just like any other? That's, that's essentially what is at the heart of this Kevin and Molly, final thoughts on this one. I should say Dave Hoppy is too humble to tell us who he is, but is among other things a former chief of staff uh, to the speaker and uh, senior senator aide, and so maybe has uh, some war wounds from uh, these fights that <laughs> yeah. might influence how we think about this. But Kevin and Molly, any final thoughts on this point? Uh, interesting thought experiment. I need to think more about it. And just to double back to, uh, to Mark's question, um, entitlement spending is especially hard to alter uh, in a negative direction uh, because entitlements feel existential. Uh, we're talking about how much money people are going to have to spend on medical care, how much money they'll have to pay the bills, feed themselves, things like that. Uh, that changing spending priorities is hard generally. Entitlements, because it's existential, all the harder. Impossible. Yeah, the only thing I'll say is I think this question of the calendar um, is, a, is a good one. And I think from my perspective, um, the, the, the challenge is actually um, not so much that the House isn't um, getting its work started in a timely manner. It is this question of what happens once the House has acted, particularly if the Senate has not acted. And then you get to this point where, as you point out, it gets to September and everything is everything is frantic. And so I think in this particular case, you know, having um, the, the House get started on its work um, early in the year and often bring some, if not all, of the bills to the floor by the um, uh, by the summer, um, I think is uh, is important. And then um, if there's a if there's a way to sort of um, as you point out, the Senate's a whole different animal to get them to speed up some of their work so that there's the potential for um, cross chamber negotiations. All right, well, thank you very much. I think if there's anything we've learned, it's that process matters and uh, has effects beyond what we might imagine. Um, I appreciate you all being here. Thank you also to the Street Institute for uh, their help uh, in, in setting all this up. And uh, let's thank our speakers.